Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We're back in our study in 2 Corinthians. Uh, we're in chapter 9. The subject is giving. The overriding principle is grace. These are some amazing chapters, these chapters 8 and 9, amazing chapters that we've looked at. It kind of puts everything in perspective when it comes to the subject of uh, the ministry to the saints, to one another, uh, in some ways a lot different than what we ever thought that it was. So this is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to try to deal with verses 10 through 13. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we stand in thy presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit praising thee for grace and love that bought us and for the opportunity to study together that which you've revealed. May the Holy Spirit take this time, speak truth to our hearts, and strip away error. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we're going through 2 Corinthians uh, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were somewhere around verse, uh, the 10th verse of the 9th chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. Whether we've realized it or not, because of the rapid pace by which we go through Scripture, We've been looking at the last chapter and a half or so at a, a very grand and glorious concept of participating in the administration of the grace of God. That this administration of grace provides a need, uh, a distribution and equality. It provides a distribution for the needs of the saints so that equality results in that distribution of the grace of God so that he who gathers much has nothing over, uh, he who gathers little has no lack. It's easy to overlook what a grand concept this is because in the main the normal attitude toward, uh, shall I use the word, Christian giving is a sense of drudgery, responsibility, tax benefit, personal gain, personal satisfaction, you know, that, that we in our hour of sufficiency were able to help somebody in need and hardly ever does it seem as though our participation in any activity for Christ is presented as a cooperative work with Him in the distribution of His grace. It's all about us. He's very little a part of it. We've seen as we've studied together that there are needs in the body of Christ and that we, what we are dealing with is the grace of God, not our money, not our time, not our talent, nor our ability, but the grace of God. That we have a glorious opportunity provided by God Almighty to participate with Him in the distribution of that grace. It works both for us and for others. By the time we, we got to the 10th verse, we found out that it is He, our Heavenly Father, who has dispersed abroad. He's the one who furnishes seed that we sow. I suggested that we sow grace. And we know, of course, that the, the, the original sower was the Lord Jesus Christ. We're just cooperating. We are participating with Him. And in addition to that, He not only provides the seed, but He provides the increase and the fruits of our righteousness. 
verse 11 says, being enriched in everything, and I, I'm going to suggest that that enriched is an enrichment from God, not from others. This is not some distribution where, you know, someone who has a lot of enrich, uh, uh, a lot of wealth or a lot of enriches enrichment. Someone who may not have gives to someone who may not have as much. This enrichment, folks, is from God Almighty, which causes by means of us thanksgiving to God, and all of a sudden we see why God is planted this way. If we looked at any particular incident, then I don't know what it might I don't know what it might be. The one that, that happens to be chosen here is an illustration by the Holy Spirit, uh, is a gift to the needs of the saints at Jerusalem. Very carefully, the Holy Spirit has avoided any indication as to what that gift might have been. Uh, only your personal prejudice, you know, your personal prejudices it's only that that makes it money. Maybe from my personal prejudice, it's canned goods. And maybe, it, you know, if you happen to own a, a, a car lot, maybe it's a used car. I don't know what it is, folks. And the Holy Spirit has not bothered to even identify it. It's only, it's only human presumption that assumes that it's money. And, and I'm surely not going to argue that it isn't money. I, I have no idea. It may have been all of those things, but what the Holy Spirit is saying here is that it's an opportunity to participate with God in the meeting of that need whose end result is thanksgiving from both parties. It's clear that in verse 11, the Holy Spirit seems to be very definitely identifying this as a glorying, and a thanksgiving to the one true God. Any other motive, any other product is false. The product of that operation is not tax benefit. It's not keeping some operation going that might fail, you know, without us. Not at all. The product is to glorify the one true God, and so they're all articulated. There must be some reason why so precisely verse after verse we have the God in verse 11. We have the God in verse 12. We have the Christ and the God both in verse 13. And in verse 14, the God. In verse 15. So there's a, there's a definite flow here were that the grammar would concentrate our attention on the one true God, not any other aspect at all, not any other aspect of this apparent human service. Dearly beloved, it is not a human service. It's God's grace. It's God's supply. It's an opportunity to work with God, and the end result whether we live up to that opportunity, you're not going to make any difference. What's going to happen is there won't be thanksgiving on your part, but the end result is praise. Thanksgiving. Glory to the one true God. It is God who has enriched us. Who It is God who enabled us to this. Whatever it might be. Your service may be some particular service. God, God enriched you and God enabled you so that you can do it and do it liberally. We may make all kinds of excuses. You know, there are some people who try to do things they're not good at doing. God has not built us all the same way nor gifted us all the same way for which we ought to be very thankful God has made us different and there are certain things in which He has enriched you 
you are very, very good at something. I, I have no idea what that is. It, it, it seems to me the supreme message of our passage is that God provided that and that, that you have an opportunity to use it liberally, the results of which are both from your standpoint and from those who reap the benefit, thanksgiving to the one true God. Verse 12, for the administration, that the word there means ministry, it means service. For the ministry of this service, and it's interesting as we go through these two chapters, whatever this specific case is, the Holy Spirit calls it grace. He calls it fellowship. He calls it ministry. He calls it an equality. He calls it an abundance. He calls it a blessing, and He calls it a service. The ministry of the service not only supplies something lacking, when it comes to the saints, his body, the church, I mean, why wouldn't he not, why would he, Christ not care for his own body members? I mean, think about that. But also supplies an abundant amount of thanksgiving to the one true God. In verse 12, the authorized version says, the administration of this service not only supplies the want of the saints. That is, I have a, a lot of money, okay, and I give it to somebody who, who has a need. I've supplied his want. I don't think that's what the verse says, folks. The word want there, I would translate that as that which lacks for the ministry of this service does two things. It supplies that which lacks on the part of the saints. And I'm talking about both the giver and the receiver. Not just the receiver, but the giver and the receiver. You know, both saints. It, it isn't the Corinthians who are supplying something that's wanting at Jerusalem. It, it is a service, and we've already had that defined as a grace of God, which supplies that which lacks in both parties. The Corinthians had something that lacked, that was made up by their operation in this ministry. The believers at Jerusalem had something that lacked. Okay? And it was made up by whatever this ministry was. In addition to that, the true result was thanksgiving to God. Thanksgiving to God. All other concepts are left unsaid because in my thinking, that would violate the entire principle of grace. You know, there are all kinds of uh, interesting Christian arguments. You know, I, I heard it in a, in a church that I attended you know, when I was in my 30s, that's, that's been, you know, just, you know, several years ago. You know, we shouldn't remove the tax benefit. You know, if we remove the charitable contribution benefit for uh, gifts, the church will go broke. It'll go bust. Well, if God's people are only giving, only participating in the support of God's work because they get a tax break, then it ought to go broke. The whole thing is, is a sham. It is so far removed from the genesis, you know, of the, uh, removed from the dynamics of this passage that it's horrifying to even think about it. <coughs> Dearly beloved, if the reason we do anything for the Lord is because there's a sense of responsibility, obligation, or, or some benefit to us, it's not what we're studying here. What we see, first of all, is an amazing demonstration 
of the grace of God. You know, the fact that He loves me. Abounding. We'll see by the time we close this chapter. The terms God uses at first are amazing, but the more we think about it, that we have a joy unspeakable, that we have a peace that passes understanding. And the chapter ends with, thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. Because if we really, can, if we can just get into our minds the truth, the reality of what God has done for us, it truly is beyond ability to describe or express. The entire operation is one of grace. The entire participation is an understanding that it's grace, that it's a service to God Almighty and nobody else, and that it results in glory and thanksgiving to Him. But it is not beyond our spiritual understanding to believe that God has a purpose in the ministry of this service, that without it there is something insufficient, something lacking in our own experience. I seriously wonder how much any one of us realizes how much God participates in our life, how much His care is always there, how much His provision is always there. Our Heavenly Father says, I know who you are. I know what you are. I made you. I sowed you. Don't worry about anything but with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep, guard is the word, your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's Philippians chapter 4. Most Christians don't even think about the verse until they're in trouble. You know, I mean, I suppose we, we run, you know, rushing headlong through life, day after day after day, very little aware of the presence of God in our life, of His power, of His, of His protection, of His provision, but it's always there. He's a never failing Heavenly Father. What a devastating thing it would be to go through our Christian experience never having had this amazing grace. Not the fact that the saints in Jerusalem needed help, that, that they were down and out, but, but that there was something that lacked in all of the saints that could be made up by simple service. The end result being not only the supply of that want, but greater thanksgiving to the one true God. You know, we've, we easily recognize the folly of Israel in, in following Baal. You know, we see the transgressions of their walk in the wilderness. We're amazed that God was there in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. And they could do the things that they did with the golden calf, and, you know, and, and with their participation in the worship of Baal. Why isn't it just as amazing today as Christians become all wrapped up in the things which, which one could almost call worship? You know, a, a worship directed to the desires and the needs of the supplicant. That's where a lot of Christians are, are not walking in peace and rest and joy. Not walking in an attitude where we're not worried about anything, but we've committed our lives entirely to God. We, we studied through the epistle of Colossians. I, 
I read in Colossians that Paul declares that we as a body of believers are, are filling up that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Now I recognize that there is absolutely no lack in our redemption. We are, are truly, positively sons of God, members of His family, and of His household eternally secure in His grace and in His power. But dearly beloved, I, I think it would be scripturally naive to suggest that because we're complete in Christ, which, which we are, of course, no, no doubt about it, that experientially there isn't something lacking. You know, there are muscles that need to be developed. There, there is a trust in God that needs to be learned and experienced. There's a realization that He's real. You know, what seems to be real today is our happiness today, our security today, our health today. And it seems to me that a, a lot of that concentration removes our trust, our rest, our peace from God. I suddenly see that, that what we have in, in view is not the fact that we have some poor Christians in Jerusalem who need, needed a dollar or two, and that we have some rich Christian someplace who could provide that money and, and, and never miss it. That is not at all the concept. That seems to be the popular concept of, of Christian giving, but that is not the concept of this chapter. What we have is a body of believers, Corinth, Philippi, Thessalonica, and so forth, and Jerusalem, that have a lack, and that lack can be provided if we understand it properly. You see, if we don't understand it properly, there's, there's the temptation for human pride. You know, oh boy, I worked, I worked hard for what I have, and, and yeah, I recognize that you know, they have a problem here. I'll send them a little bit, you know, and there's no recognition of God's provision, God's supply, God's administration. There's no result in thanksgiving. There, there's only a little glory to us, a little self-satisfaction, you know, that, that we spend a little bit of money to help, help somebody out. I think it's an easy thing for a minister to stand up and put you to shame on that. I doubt seriously there's anybody here that gives one Tenth, and I say this lovingly, as much to the Lord as they spend on themselves. You know, and we could run a we could run a guilt trip on one another till the end of the age if you want to do that. I, if that's what you want to do, I, we can do that. But the presentation of the Word of God is not a guilt trip. We were already told in 1 Corinthians that if we properly presented the truth of the Word of God, it comforts. That's not a guilt trip. That it encourages. Well, that's not a guilt trip. That it instructs. Now, somebody might argue that a guilt trip instructs, but I do not believe that, that that's a proper presentation of the Word of God. If we, if we go with that kind of logic, then the inevitable result of our participating in some need is personal satisfaction, personal pride. You know, that by our genius, our ingenious financial capability and, and our diligence and our hard work, we were able to help out some poor, less fortunate soul who, you know, who, who well, who probably goofed off, you know, his whole life. You know, and we have all the, the wrong idea. I am not suggesting that we ought to just promiscuously help out those who refuse to work. 
I mean, surely the scriptural principle is he that does not work shall not eat. But that's not the concept of, of this passage. No one should put that kind of constraint on you. You know, when, when what you ought to do in participating in any service for Christ, it's, it is you do what you previously decided to do. We already read it, folks, as every man has already purposed, already purposed in his heart, so let him give. But in your authorized version, the word give is not there. Your participation in whatever opportunity for service that you have is that participation which you've already previously decided to do and no one, no one is going to put necessity or constraint on you. You're going to do it graciously, with joy, because you recognize it as operating, cooperating with the Lord Jesus Christ that it supplies a want, a thing lacking in your life and a thing lacking in other li others' lives. But more than that, supremely more than that, dearly beloved, is that it results in an abundant thanksgiving to the one true God. Verse 13. Here's a verse that I'm going to really rip up. You know, if, if you don't know any of the original languages, you might, you might talk to the experts around who do. I don't, I don't like to take liberties with any translation. I recognize that the translator goes through the same constraints that I do, and I feel that every once in a while somebody gets the idea that I'm running down the authorized version, the King James Version. I'm not. I'm not. I, th I think it's a beautiful language. I, uh, I do believe that there is value, particularly if you are not a student of the original languages, to compare several translations because then you can begin to get a, a glimpse into the turmoil of the translator. But uh, in 1611, you know, they didn't say things exactly like we say them now. You know, I, I doubt that our young people could have communicated with English people in 1611. You know, if you'd have told them that you had a, if you'd have said that you, you had a, a pair of dumb shoes, you know, the poor Englishman wouldn't, would have struggled a long time trying to figure out what you said. You know, he heard the words, but they didn't convey any meaning. Sometimes the language of 1611 is not clear in 2023. So I'm going to change that just a little bit, you know. If you have the, uh, the authorized version, the King James uh, Version. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ, and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. Now, I'd like to just sort of rip that up a little bit. You know, I'll give you the Sewell translation here, which, which of course, you know, we know is the right one, you know. Through the truth of this ministry, this service, they glorify the one true God. For your submissive confession unto the gospel of the Christ, and for your simple and sincere fellowship with them and with all. Now I recognize that the translators were trying to emphasize to you that we are we are looking principally at a financial gift to believers who needed money and that there's always been a slight prejudice on the part of the organized church to, to get money. 
probably the major step forward was when the Southern Baptist Convention defined the storehouse as the church. Well, you know, so so that they could now bring their their tithes and offerings into the storehouse. You know, if, if they still lived in the Old Testament, where most Christians still live. However, that definition was simply a definition of ignorance, which which isn't unusual for the Southern Baptist Convention. Well, be that as it may, this video is not is not a video out to intentionally tear down the Southern Baptist Convention. It's always been the need within the organized church folks to, to emphasize financial responsibility, financial need, I'm not suggesting that the translators are entirely wrong. I'm simply saying that I believe that there is a much, much deeper meaning here than just the giving and the receiving of money. In fact, I believe that we have departed from the physical content of the gift by this portion of the Scripture. By the time we get to this, this part here, and we're looking at rather at God's design purpose in this service. First of all, in verse 12, the ministry of this service does several things. It provides that which is lacking on the part of the saints, and that's, that's both from the one who is providing the service and the one who is receiving the service. And it results in thanksgiving to God. It's also tested. My text is it is also proved. The proving of this ministry, that is the ministry of this service, results in glory to the one true God because of a true confession, a submissive confession to the gospel of Christ. That's what categorically tests it as being genuine, as being true. Not the, not the accrued benefit to the giver or the server, not looking at the results. This, this must be right because we have, you know, 10,000 views, right? Okay, so, so, you know, that must be wrong because we only have three or four you know, this must be right because that church is growing and, and this must be wrong because that other one isn't. The true test that results in glorying the one true God is a submissive confession, a true confession of the gospel of Christ. And I think herein lies a problem because once, once you've defined what the gospel of the one true Christ is, well, then you can always make your work fit that definition. And it seems to me that the only correct definition is that which is Scripture, not that which is a, a definition made up by man. The Gospel of Christ. Well, I know what that is. Yeah, you know. You could go to heaven if you want to. If you will just accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you'll go to heaven. If you reject Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you'll go to hell. And once I've defined that as the gospel of Christ, everything else becomes a means to an end. But if that in fact is not the gospel of Christ, then I am far away from the thrust of this verse. I think supremely important in that verse is the definition of the gospel of Christ. I don't mean to infer in any way that this ministry makes the correct definition and, and most others make the wrong one. I, you know, everybody else is wrong but us. That cannot be true. We are not an island, okay? 
you don't want to get the idea that God is so limited that he, he only has a wagon load of Christians at BHF and everybody else is far from the truth. That would be pure nonsense. First of all, surely, folks, you, you'd have to agree, definition is infinitely more important here. Rather than come to grips with the Word of God, it seems as though we'd like to just sit back, you know, listen to a few sermons, decide who's right, decide who to believe concerning what the Gospel of Christ is, and, and that's it. That's it. We now know that we don't have to worry about it anymore. It needs no further study. You know, if two times two is four, then let's be done with that. You know, we, we know that that's true. We never have to study it again. And I fear that many approach the Word of God that way. We are not, not studying together a scientific textbook, okay? We're studying together the Word of God. And though what it says may be implicitly obvious to you because, you know, because your heart is enlightened, you know, God has revealed truth to you. That doesn't mean that a darkened heart can see it or that any amount of argument or debate will open that darkened heart, folks, because it won't. It simply won't. The reason I bring that up is that arguments are often based upon false definitions. Now, we could do the same in, in this verse. Do you have a true submissive confession of the gospel of Christ? What is a submissive confession to the gospel of Christ? Your authorized version says a professed subjection, a professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ. The Greek reads a submissive confession into, the word is ace, into the gospel of the Christ. Well, what is a submissive confession? Here is a combination of two words that are fraught with meaning. It's not only a confession of the gospel of Christ, it is a submissive confession of the gospel of Christ. Well, how did you and I become submissive? How did you and I become submissive into the gospel of Christ? Well, we see the Scriptures declaring that for whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, and whom He did predestinate, them He also called, and whom He called, them He also justified, and whom He justified, them He also glorified. And yet it is by far and away the prevalent thought of modern Christianity that without something on the part of man, the grace of Christ is not efficacious. And that's the same as saying it never was. It never was. Grace never was grace. It was always reward. Never has been grace. It's been reward. You know, if you do certain things, God will reward you. If you don't do certain things, God will judge you. Yet the scriptural concept is that it's never been reward. It has always been grace. One of the uh, illustrations used for the Galatians, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was or all the children of promise. Now, if we never read the Old Testament, that, 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 that probably that wouldn't make any sense. But if we read the Old Testament, we know that Isaac was promised some 12 to 14 years before he was ever born. Isn't the Holy Spirit clearly saying that you are a promise to the Lord Jesus Christ before you were ever born? 
just like Isaac was? And if so, then why do we sing, stand up and sing, Jesus paid it all, and then sit down, close the hymn book, sit down, and then put all the ifs on it? If, in fact, the good news of Christ is the good news of a finished transaction rather than a, a, a potential reality, if that's true, I now have a ministry, a service, that is only tested by the submissive confession of that truth. If, on the other hand, the gospel of Jesus Christ is that God almost did something and, and you, you could finish it, then some of the glory's got to go the wrong way and it doesn't work. If the gospel of Christ is a finished transaction, then there can be a very single-minded, I, I translated it sincere and single-minded, that's what the word means. I think a literal translation of the Greek would mean a single-minded fellowship, a purposeful fellowship, a sincere fellowship. The direction of my fellowship, my service for the Lord Jesus Christ is based entirely upon a finished transaction, not on something that I did or may not have done. It can be, it can be single-minded, sincere, a single-minded fellowship with them and with all. Obviously, this verse has lifted itself from the realm of a financial offering made to believers uh, at, at Jerusalem, uh, or it wouldn't have said, with all. And the chapter ends with thanks be unto God for His indescribable gift. And that's, so I don't, I don't have to worry about that verse. It's indescribable, so might as well jump right over it. Right? All right, that wasn't very funny. Surely there's no indication that you ought to give like he gave. You couldn't possibly ever give like he gave, folks. But dearly beloved, do you view, do you consider God's grace in your life indescribable? Well, we're going to talk more about that. We've reached the end of the chapter, but Lord willing, we'll continue next week. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until then, thanks for watching.